that you have decided to join us today for Let's Chat, Stories of Faith that Uplift and Inspire. I will be interviewing guests and letting them share their story. You know, there's nothing more powerful than a story. And when someone relates their own experience of how God's working in their life, the aha moments, maybe that time of salvation, maybe when God came through when there was no hope left. And that's what these stories are here to give you, to inspire you, to give you hope, to keep keeping on and let God guide you through your life. Again, I'm Delinda Lane. Thanks for joining us. And coming up next is our next guest. And I have a beautiful, wonderful, great friend of mine with us today, Lynn Franklin. So hi, Lynn. How are you? Hi, Delinda. And hi, everybody else who gets to hang out with us today. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> lucky. Absolutely. Absolutely. We were chatting just a few minutes ago. It's like, we could talk for hours together. We never run out of anything to talk about. But don't worry, this isn't going to be a two-hour show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is just so fun to um, to catch up. You know, we get we actually do a call together every week for about what have we said six, seven years, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's been a while. So I'm like, yay, pretty nice. So, Lynn, tell us about you just personally. Um, who are you? I know you're involved in something pretty fun right now. You could bring that in if you want, but whatever you want to tell us about you. Hey, well, you know, uh, uh, Delinda knows that I'm a neuroscience nerd, so I study how the brain works, and then I figure out how to bring that into the real world to help people better connect with each other. Because my, you know, my mission is to use communication, help people solve their problems and get what they want. And so when people say, Lynn, what do you do? It's, you know, I fast track leaders using ideas and caring so they can be seen, heard, and promoted. And how that looks depends upon what they need. The whole thing for me is how can we be better communicators? And some of it is based on how our brains work. And some of it's based on common sense. And some of it's based on uncommon sense. But it's a, a wonderful ride to be on. I get to speak on stages. I get to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I get to do training for organizations. And every once in a while, as you'll see right now, uh, my dog, Simon, will walk around behind us. You'll see his tail. And uh, and he usually hangs out with me, which is another blessing that I have in my life. Good old Simon. Yeah. And um, in regard to you have something opening up this weekend, this is a little side thing you've got going on. Tell us about that. Oh, thanks for asking. <laughs> I do every year I do or the last three years I've done something which is called a Purim spiel. I don't happen to be Jewish, but I'm in a Jewish play where I play a Jewish woman by the name of Esther Finkelstein, who's a lawyer. And what, what a Purim spiel is, for those of you who don't know, because I didn't know until I started participating in one, is that in the spring, around Easter time, uh, Jewish people celebrate something called Purim. And this is the story from the Old Testament book of Esther. And in order to make it relevant, what they do is they turn it into a musical. So it's a musical comedy retelling of the story of Esther. Wow. And basically all I love this. All of my Jewish friends say every Jewish holiday has three things. They tried to kill us. They didn't succeed. Let's eat. So this is all about the, the story of how Esther saved the Jewish people from being annihilated in Persia. And then at the end, there's a big festival and everybody eats. <laughs> you know, I forgot that about that being that each year was just a different way of telling the Esther story. And mm -hmm. I love that story. I, I just, you know, called for such a time as this. I mean, that's the main main mm -hmm. part of that. I, I love that. And yeah, when when things seem overwhelming and we think one person can't make a difference, and certainly not us, there always is that opportunity. And you know, and in this case, Esther saved all the people who happened to be in Persia because part of the, that story is that the king, because he was getting bad counsel from his uh, his number two person who hated Jews and wanted them all dead. Uh, 
The king ends up marrying Esther and she saves her people. One woman did that for the, for the tribe in Persia. And for us, we don't have to save an entire tribe. Sometimes all we can try to do is save ourselves. But it becomes the, yes, we can make a difference in our life by the things that we choose. Yeah, absolutely. I think, too, it's also a story of God's faithfulness. If we'll just be obedient. And I mean, she could have said no. I mean, she could have said, Mordecai, uh -uh, I'm not doing that. He's going to kill mm -hmm. me. I mean, she had many excuses she could have given. But mm -hmm. if she if she walked that, her she was being faithful to God. But he, at the same time, was being faithful to her and the fact that she was willing to go and put her really put her life on the line. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty, pretty great story in many facets for sure. So we yep. were- And then you add singing and dancing and it's even more fun. <laughs> and I do want the link on how to watch you in this. It's like, I wish I could be there. If it wasn't quite so long of a trip, I would have mm -hmm. to consider that. Mm -hmm. But I, I just love it. So I definitely want to see the link when it's, when it's done, whenever you have that. I'll make sure you get it. All right, cool. Well, let's talk about, um, let's just talk about uh, how you, so tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Um, I do know that you were raised a Catholic, so you could just mm -hmm. start there and then mm -hmm. go wherever you want. Matt, well, you know, there, there are lots of rules and regulations in Catholicism, and I've not traditionally been a big rule follower, but the, you know, the, the one thing that's always been clear to me is that I'm not in this by myself, that there is, you know, that God in, you know, and, and Catholics particularly believe in, in saints and other people who intercede for them with, with God, you know, it, to, to be honest with you, my parents uh, were divorced. We were the only divorced Catholic family in the small town in, in Minnesota where I grew up. And I was going to a Catholic school at the time and it was really hard. And I remember, you know, lots of kids and I was in a really small uh, class. And I remember as this was going on, instead of going to recess, I would just go and sit in church, which was right next to the school and talk to God. You know, here's what's going on this week, God. Here's the trouble that I'm having. You know, please, you know, help me out with this. And, you know, the kids are being mean to me. You know, there's the, you know, the old snarky stuff that goes on. But there was also the, I don't know how we're going to do this. And, you know, and this really led to my first truly spiritual experience, which was when my father sat my mother, my brother, and myself down to let us know that he was leaving. And I remember at the time, and I was 11, just, you know, it was almost like an out-of-body experience. I was there, but I wasn't there. And there were, you know, so my father says, basically, I'm packing up and going. And I, I can't remember what led up to it. But what I do remember is saying to him that, you know, we had a family, our family was like a four legged stool. And if he was leaving, that was like taking one leg out from under the stool. And that the other three legs are going to have to figure out how, how to you know, keep the stool holding up. And I remember at the time, just I was looking outside as I was saying it. I wasn't even making eye contact with anybody. And I, it felt as though I was being spoken through rather than these were my words. And I thought, you know, somebody else is, is speaking through me. And, I, and, it, and that's why I thought, yeah, it's like God. And it did not change the situation, but it expressed how I was feeling. And, you know, and so then now, you know, that's why I was going to, you know, recess in the church, trying to, you know, keep myself going uh, because my family really did disintegrate for a time. And, uh, and my mother ended up in a mental institution for a while. And so it was, how do we keep ourselves going and recreate our family and build a better one? And fortunately, I was lucky because God sent me and all of us, as, you know, my stepfather, who showed up a few years later, and we all needed each other greatly, and we all pulled each other together and then became a better family than we would have had my father stayed. So there's been, you know, spiritual intervention in my life, and, and I'm grateful for it. 
and and Delinda just heard this story, which happened when I was in my twenties in Minnesota. And I had been visiting a friend. It was a winter's night. I was driving back from her house and my car started losing energy. And I knew it was my battery and that my alternator was bad. And so I just kind of coast over to the side of the road and it's dark and it's cold. And there aren't all that many cars going by because it's late enough at night. And in the days before cell phones, what could you do? And the the you know, the battery was the the flashers weren't working on the off of the battery anymore. And I'm standing next to my car, just hoping police will come by. And a car pulls up, you know, slows down, pulls up in front of mine, and a fellow gets out. And of course, a little bit at first, I'm nervous about well, who the heck is this guy? And is am I going to get myself into more trouble than I'm already in? And <laughs> well, uh, scary and, out on a dark road. Yeah. And, and so he asked me what's wrong and I know what's wrong. Hey, you know, my battery's dead because my alternator's not working. And he said, well, I just happen to be a car battery salesman and I have an extra battery in my trunk. And so he says, let me go get that. I said, well, I've got the jumper cables. You got the battery. So we hooked up my car to his battery and it starts to charge. And he says to me, it seems like from some of the things that, that you said that, you know, you, you know, accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And I thought, if I answer this wrong, he's going to disconnect my battery and I'm going to be screwed. But at the same time, you don't want to lie to somebody. And fortunately for me, I, you know, I turned to him and I said, Jesus has gotten me out of a lot of tough spots, including this one, which was true. So he juiced up my battery enough for me to be able to get home and then call a tow truck the next day. And, you know, how did that happen? It was nothing I could have said or done that created that. There was a higher power intervening for me. And that's really been the story of my faith, is that when things really seem hard and I don't know a way through, to be able to turn it over to God and ask for help, sometimes it's a prayer. Sometimes it's just you know me sitting in the church talking. Help shows up when I ask for it. And I'm really grateful for that. Yes. And in, that's just so the way God is, you know, when we'll just reach out. And I think sometimes we just think we can just keep handling it all ourselves all the time. You know, so, oh, I got this God or whatever that is. You know, I, let me, let me try a little bit longer to keep doing this by myself. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, Lord, go ahead. Just take it, you know, letting him. Mm -hmm. Um, do that because he knows it so much better than we do you know he, mm -hmm. he sees the whole scale of things and so when we can just really depend on him to come come through for us mm -hmm. and it, it could just make all the difference in the world yeah it's true because you know the kind of upbringing that you've had a, a sense of that I I experienced it became I didn't trust people you know, I would have to figure things out for myself. I had to take care of myself. I couldn't believe that anybody else was going to be in there looking out for me. And so to learn to ask for help has been difficult for me. But the, the amazing and amusing thing about it is pretty much every time I ask for help, I just say, okay, I, no, I can't handle this. I can't be in charge of this. I can't direct this. And I ask for help. Usually something better shows up than I could have created had I really been in control. <laughs> yeah. The, when we think that we are in control. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. The, the but, illusion of control. Yeah. There you go. The illusion of it. Uh, yeah. The, um, I, I think that just so often that is the case. And I can see where, like you were saying, the way you were raised, it probably has made it hard to, to ask help and take help maybe from people, the people around you or family, whatever that looks like, as well as God himself. So we get, mm -hmm. you know, the, because you had in your early years, didn't have that, you know, it makes it, you don't want to be disappointed. You don't want to be mm -hmm. turned out. You don't want to ask and then say no, mm -hmm. but yet the more of the yeses that we have, the more that we reach out and particularly when we reach out to God and ask and he provides for us. And as you said, provides better than we could have imagined it in the first place. That's mm -hmm. really amazing. And he does that. Yeah. It's, it's the good reminder that I don't need to be in charge all the time. 
<laughs> and because a lot of times it's better when I'm not. Yeah. And I think that's one for all of us. I think we can all really benefit from remembering that uh, because we just don't have the resources, you know, to be able to know what's around the corner, you know, what would be the best answer. All we can do is give our best choice at that moment in time. But when mm -hmm. we really rely on the, on the Lord to strengthen us and to guide us, um, his way is just always so much better. Mm -hmm. It really is. So do you have um, any other, um, I don't know, aha moments or, I mean, that's a pretty great one. I, I, can't, I can't believe the guy asked you that. I mean, that's like, really? Okay, that means I'm not being very bold. I'm not asking people on the street that question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and at the same time, who knows, maybe it was, maybe that inspiration did come from God to remind me because at, you know, at that moment, I was just so freaking relieved that somebody was there to help me. And what his question did was remind me that, no, it's not that I had manifested this on my own, you know, left to my own devices, I'd probably still be out there. <laughs> waiting for somebody to help me and uh but it's that's one of the things that's wonderful about about faith and spirituality is that the little miracle moments are all around us and that for me was a reminder that yeah yeah here's another one lynn pay attention right right and i do think there are those you know um little miracles exactly what you're saying um just little miracles that just happen <clears throat> but sometimes we're just so focused in like this without our head up that we that we miss out on a lot of them i think there's more blessings out there than we probably i mean than we have any idea just mm -hmm. god's providing these things for us um um, and I'm going to go down a little different road here, if that's okay, and only answer it as much as you want. Um, but I know, as as we're friends, that you know you've had some really tough times. You you know you've had your parents pass away. Um, mm -hmm. Your mom, you've been a caregiver for your mom until she passed. Um, and I know that um, I'm thinking of in particular a couple things that you had told me about that sometimes you would go and just, you, you would take her out and you would just have such a nice time. It would be like going back to the old, old days, for lack of a better word, you know, and then the, mm -hmm. those moments, and those are really, I think those are God moments, those special times that you had with your mom when a lot of times she wasn't able to do that. Would that mm -hmm. be true? You want to talk about that a little bit or not? Well, and, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things because my mother had Alzheimer's and she spent the last few years of her life living in a memory care unit. And my mother was the world's biggest shopper, still lived in, in Minnesota. So her favorite place to go was the Mall of America, which is my idea of hell. <laughs> and so, you know, and the, the scoop is I would take her to the Mall of America, not because I wanted to go and not because I wanted to buy anything, but because there were so many sensory experiences for her to have. And she would look around and see things and some of them would be familiar and some of them would not. But it was as, as though he didn't have to remember because uh, her short term memory was gone. She didn't have to remember things and she could just be surrounded by you know, lights and sounds and people and remember that how much she loved to shop. And it was, it, it truly was like having her back before she had Alzheimer's. And, you know, and that too was a gift. So isn't it interesting that getting my mother back happened by me doing something I really didn't want to do. And at the same time, that was the thing that allowed her to, you know, to be herself in that moment. So yeah, it's not that I, I sit here and ask for stuff and it magically materializes. But <laughs> yeah, sometimes doing the things you don't want to do are the things that manifest the stuff that you want to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. And because 
we're not always going to get to do the things we want. That just isn't mm -hmm. the way life is, right? And I'm mm -hmm. with you. Going to the Mall of America would not be my idea of a fun time to do. We've done it a couple of times when kids were young. But, um, but I know yeah, I've, like I've been known as a, an A to B shopper. I know what I want. I go to the store. I get it. And then I leave. And then you're gone. Right. <laughs> and if so I my mother was a real park, browser. Yeah. If, if I can park right by the door to go in the store to what I need, I don't want to have to walk through multi layers of things to go find it. Mm -hmm. um, just crazy, crazy. Well, so Lynn, tell us a little bit about your business. You are an amazing speaker. That's where Lynn and I met, as a matter of fact, at a, at a um, speaker thing conference that we mm -hmm. went to and uh so she just uh there's so many different things would you like to talk about that a little bit oh sure hey you know because it's like like what delinda does i love what i do and i mentioned i'm a neuroscience nerd so i studied the boring brain research and then i try to figure out how can i use this to help people do a better job of connecting with each other and as as delinda this is delinda's favorite one I call it the seven second rule. So I'll ask you, have you ever been in a conference or a networking situation and you've been chatting away with somebody you've never met before and about two minutes in, you realize you cannot for the life of you remember this person's name. And of course you try to look at their name badge and if it's a woman, her hair's covering it up or it's back behind her collar, or if it's a guy, he's wearing one of those long lanyards. And I mean, you look down there and try to read his name and you can get a sexual harassment lawsuit. Yeah. So it's like, they're not helping you. And you don't want to let them know that you've forgotten their names. And then of course, one of your friends shows up and wants you to introduce this person whose name that you forgot and you were tap dancing as fast as you can. That's something that's pretty familiar with most of us. Okay, so here's the neuroscience behind why that happens. The first seven seconds after you meet a new person, your brain is overwhelmed with data because your brain is trying to figure out how much of a risk and a threat this person is. And so you're getting bombarded with data, but your conscious mind can only process between 10 to 50 bits of information per second, and you're getting way more than that. All right. And so that's usually when people introduce themselves, you know, hi, my name is your brain does not have the bandwidth because there's too much stuff going on and it takes it out. And the other thing is that names have no inherent meaning in our brains unless we can make an immediate connection. So if I say, you know, hi, my name's Lynn and you have a cousin named Lynn, okay, I got a shot because you can make an association. But if I say, hi, my name's Norma and you've never been a Norma before in your life, your brain just throws that out. Right. And the third bit of research is in Western cultures, our first name, most important word in the language to us. So now our brain is conspiring against us for remembering the thing that would help us build connection with this new person. So that's the data. And I say, now that you know this, use the seven second rule, which is when you're meeting new people, either in a business or a family and friend setting, Never introduce yourself in the first seven seconds of having met a new person because your brain does not have the bandwidth. Well, you can't stand there silently for seven seconds while your brain catches <laughs> up with you. So what do you do? And I say you do one of two things. You ask a question like, oh, is this the first time that you've ever been to this conference? And let them answer. Or you make a statement like, oh, isn't it a beautiful day outside? And let them respond to that. And you know, by the time they're done, now your brain is ready to focus and you can ask the person their name. And you know, and most people will give you their first and last names. Screw their last name. They don't care if you remember that. They want you to remember their first name. So now you do all of those tricks they've been telling you for years to do to remember somebody's name. You look them in the eyes and you repeat their first name a couple of times in conversation. And that moves it from your short into your long-term memory. So now you've got a better shot at remembering it when your friend shows up and wants you to introduce this person. <laughs> so I call it the seven second rule. Now, you know, it's not that you're bad with names. Everybody's bad with names, but now you have a system to be better. Absolutely. And I love that. And I share that all the time to people say, but I, it's not my original comes from my friend Lynn. <laughs> well, and it's it's something that works. So it's yeah, you 
You don't have to worry when you go to big events and you're meeting new people now. You can just use this because it focuses your brain and it works. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be using it. <laughs> so that is, that is excellent. Well, how do you find that you're, you know, because this is, we're kind of all talking about faith and our journey. How do you see your faith playing out in your business? You know, mm -hmm. well, and, you know, as, as Delinda mentioned, both of my parents passed away last year and in short order. And I spent much of my time doing my best to care for both of them long distance. One was in Minnesota and one was in Arizona. And I, it, there came a point where I couldn't do all I needed to do for them and still do my business. So I started setting aside the things I needed to do to help my business grow, to, uh, to help my parents, and frankly, to help them pass in as loving a way as I could. And so then after both of them are gone and then I'm tied up with all of their estate stuff, getting that those things settled. And then it was the beginning of this year and I didn't have a whole lot of business. And suddenly, and, and I started feeling their loss more deeply because I didn't have all of these other task things to do. And whenever I'm in a situation, because nobody's business is like a hockey stick of, stick of growth, that it's always going up all of the time. There are cycles to everything. And the one question I've learned to ask when I'm feeling frightened about things, when the, the future doesn't look as certain or as rosy as I wish it would, to actually pause and say, what has this time been opened up for me to do? which is not so much a task oriented thing for me, but kind of a spiritual question. All right, I'm supposed to be taking a breather now. How do I, how do I make that look or how should that look for me? And my answer at this point became, well, you know, I've created a system that I call persuasion GPS, which is how do you get to where you want to go faster? And in my world, G stands for goals because magic things happen in the world and in your brain when you set goals well. P is for people, not just knowing who they are, but knowing how their brains work and how to do a better job of connecting with them. And S is for showcase. Showcase what's in it for them by speaking a language that they understand. And I thought, this is my big new idea. I think the time has been opened up for me to write my next book on persuasion GPS. And by doing that, it helps me organize all of my thoughts so I can do a better job of approaching associations and companies who want a speaker who can help their people do a better job of connecting. Because my definition of persuasion is not like anybody else's, because most people think of it as oh, it's somebody trying to manipulate us or control us or get us to do stuff we don't want to do. You know, in my world, persuasion is presenting your ideas in a way that people can see them, hear them, and feel them, and then make a good decision about whether or not what you're proposing is what they ought to do. And if it is, for them to say yes faster, and if it's not, for them to say no. But you built such goodwill with them over this process that if they ever need what you do, they'll they'll come back to you. Or if they run into somebody else who needs this, they'll refer you. So persuasion is not about getting everybody to say yes to you. It's about helping people make good decisions. And if I can speak well about these things and show people that there's a system they can use to do a better job of presenting their ideas in a way that others can receive them, by writing this book, I'm pulling out all kinds of stuff I haven't thought about in a long time. I'm making it an easy to use system. And then I can use this as the next platform for where my business is going. And frankly, if I hadn't focused on my parents and if I hadn't had this time, and frankly, if they hadn't left me the money that's sustaining me through this, I would not be writing this book today. And I would not be taking my career to the next place it's going to go. So that's truly a faith thing as well, isn't it? Once again, if I were in charge and controlling everything, I would not have arranged it this way. <laughs> but there's somebody was out there looking for me, looking out for me, and I'm grateful for that. 
Yeah, right, right. Good way to look at to look at that. And I think too, um, as the it, you took the time to do what was most important. You know, you had the time, you know, to to give to your parents to to do, you know, like driving to Minnesota every other weekend or whatever that looked like. It kind of varied throughout that time. You know, you you put the priority where it needed to be, and now that's all passed, and that everything has changed. And it, like you said, it opened up this new time that now you can get it together and, and continue to move forward in a totally different way. But it's it's um, really benefiting you at this time to be able to do that. Yeah, that's true. Because as I watched my business slow down, of course I was terrified. And of course, I want to you know, give me more business. I want more business now. And the truth was, if I had had more things to do, then I wouldn't have had the wherewithal to do them. And it just would have made me crazy. As, as Delinda knows, there was one point where things were particularly difficult for both of my parents toward the end for both of them. And I stood in my living room and I stamped my foot and I said, why don't you all just die so I can finally have a life? You know, and grateful, it was, it was it was an expression of me being human, you know, and I don't feel guilty about that because that's exactly where I was in that moment. And I needed to get that out of my body. Otherwise, if I just buried it, it's you know, feelings of like mercury. You push them down one place, they bubble up someplace else. And usually out of totally out of proportion to the thing that's that's uh, bringing them to and the surface. really inappropriate time. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, and uh, does not make things any better. And so at the same time, when this happened, I do believe I was heard that, yes, I've reached the end of my rope. I don't have any more resources. You know, what, you know, how, how am I going to live through this? And, you know, and then the next phase happened where both of my parents literally died within two months of each other. I don't think I caused it, but I do think this was my, hey, I need help. And I was heard. And I think that, that at some point you will be sharing through your writings, not putting any deadlines, but very likely of, of helping people learn to cope during those those times mm -hmm. in the middle of, of caretaking and, and just going through that process because it's hard and not everybody has. You know, I haven't yet, but it may yet come you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but those hard times do, do come along the way in some shape or form. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. passing on. And to, yeah. And to not beat yourself up for being human. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right. Right. That, you know, that, you know, David, you know, the Bible, David was great at that. He would just stomp his feet and all these terrible people and just smoke them and kill them. And, <laughs> All of these things, this is, but I do believe in you, Jude. You know, I, I do believe in you, Lord. You are the Savior. He, he always brings it back, but he allows himself to say all that stuff that he wants to get it out. Right? Mm -hmm. He's a he's a great example of that. So yeah, well, it, it's true. I mean, we we have a tendency to categorize things as positive emotions and negative emotions. I I don't buy into that. Our emotions are neutral. They are what we're feeling. How we act on them is what makes other people believe they are positive or negative things. For us, it's, you know, emotions are energy that builds up in our body. And if you try to push them down, bad crap happens. And so it's, for me, it's the, it's the release valve and having great friends like Delinda and other people I'm blessed to have in my life you have to have people you can really be yourself with. And that too is a gift. That really, it really is. And I would, uh, as we're getting ready to close up here, I think that's something to remember, as Lynn was saying. You know, if you have those people in your life, take a look at who you have in your life and really be grateful for them, you know, and maybe it's time to reach out and tell them how much you appreciate having them in your life because it's, just not everybody you can be totally honest with and mm -hmm. allow yourself to just allow yourself to feel whatever that is, you know, mm -hmm. I like that Lynn, that there's not really positive and negative. It's just an emotion that you're feeling 
and what you do with it, I guess, is what really makes the difference, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and and just let me slip one other thing in there that I find really yeah, helpful. Good. There, are, there are two. So not only do I value the fact that there, I'm surrounded by people who care about me, no matter what I say and do. I obviously need to be that kind of person too in their lives. And one of the ways that this shows up is that there are two different types of listening. The first one is the most common. It's called listening to respond. So what we're doing is we're paying attention to what somebody is saying. And then when they stop talking, we can say what we believe is the appropriate follow-up to that. You know, and sometimes we're a little too full of ourselves and we're not even paying that much attention to them. And we're trying to think about what it is we're going to say when they finally shut up. So that's the surface level. There's a deeper level of listening called listening for understanding and empathy, which is where, of course, you're paying attention to what they're saying, but you're also giving them your full attention. So you're giving them eye contact, if they like eye contact, you're looking at their body language, you're listening to their voice tone and the, the quality of their voice and getting the full picture of them. You're truly making them the center of the universe at this moment. And I believe most of us wander around feeling chronically unseen and unheard. And when somebody gives us their full attention, that too is a gift. And it makes them feel special. And for us to be able to deliver that to the people in our lives, that's a true gift. And one of the things that happens from a neuroscience perspective is that when you do that for somebody else, the reward centers in their brain light up as though you are giving them money or they're doing something fun. And the other thing that happens is that the part of their brain that has positive memories and you know, and remembers ideas that also lights up. So it's not just that you're giving them your full attention; you're helping them feel better about themselves. That's awesome. And that's a great gift to give. That really is. That is great. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Well, you know, because that's what we're asking for from uh, from God, isn't it? Listen to me fully. Understand me. And then send me the things that will help me or prevent me from doing the things where I'm, you know, shooting myself in the foot. Right. <laughs> Cause there is that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for being on. I just love it that you did and shared your various things of your life with us. We appreciate that a lot. Any last comment that you want to make before we, before we finish? You know, if, if there are, because <laughs> I was going to say, if there's one piece of advice I would give, it would be don't give advice. <laughs> really, listen for understanding and empathy. Don't tell people what to do, but just be present for them. And frankly, when you model that kind of behavior, they'll give it back to you too. And for you to be seen and heard and valued, you know, none of us get enough of that. So when we can create that for other people and then show them how they can create that for us, boy, it makes our lives a whole lot more livable because, you know, one final neuroscience nugget, which is that research shows that 90% of our thoughts are thoughts we've had before. And 80% of those are negative. So all of this negative stuff we're running around with that we've thought before, and it's a trench that we dig in our minds so we go back to those negative things. If not giving advice is a good thing for the people around you, questioning the negative stories that you tell yourself or deciding to tell yourself another story supported by your faith, those are things that make a difference in your life, in the lives of the people around you and make your life a whole lot better place to be living. Amen. That is good. <laughs> well, thank you again so much. And everybody, I uh, appreciate you being here, giving us your time. As I say many times, um, it, your time is the best gift you can give anybody. So the fact that you would join us, uh, we just really appreciate it so much. So go out, take care. And I wishing you blessings indeed as you go forward. Take care now. Bye. Hi there. Thank you so much for watching or listening to our Let's Chat podcast.
I hope that it has ministered to you. I hope you feel uplifted and encouraged after watching the show. But it occurred to me that maybe you might not know what we're talking about. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you're not a Christian and you don't really understand what we're talking about when we talk about God being with you holding your hand, having your back, walking this life with you. So I just wanted to give this little message to you and let you know that Jesus loves you absolutely, 100% unconditionally. That is great news, right? John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever, that means you, whosoever believes in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. And you can put your name in that and just know that for God so loved you that he gave his son so that you can have eternal life. So you can have a life knowing that you're not alone, that you're not by yourself and that there's a God who loves you unconditionally. That's the biggest message of being a Christian. That's what believing is all about. That's that faith of having someone, having the God Almighty holding your hand as you walk through life. If you have any questions about that, I would love to chat with you. You can get a hold of me. My information is right here on the page. Keep in mind about this. God created the world for us, for all of humans. He made it beautiful and perfect. We all stumbled. Adam and Eve were disobedient in the garden. You know that story, I'm sure. But God knew that he would need to send his son to die on the cross and rise again. And if you believe that, maybe you've never made a profession of faith. Maybe you've never just said, Lord, come into my heart. That's all it takes. It's just a decision. The best decision you could ever make, I might add. But when you make a decision for Jesus, it's all about just saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I cannot handle all this on my own. I need you. Come into my heart and let me walk this journey with you. So that's it. Just say yes. Say yes to Jesus. Say any prayer you want that just acknowledges that you're a sinner and you need help and you want him to live in your heart. It's that easy. So again, let me know if you need any help, if you have any questions, because I would love to be here to walk this journey with you. Take care, my sweet friends, and believe that God loves you. Stop.